Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason, where I need to get Stephen on the screen. Oh, boy. There, there he is. There's Stephen. Uh, <laughs> so today on the show, we have Stephen Fabre. How you doing? I'm good. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me today. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm super excited to have you on the show. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. We're doing something that if you told me that I had to build it in 90 minutes, I would tell you it was impossible. But uh, before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about you. So for folks who are not familiar with you and your work, do you want to give us a bit of a background on yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Stephen Fabre, or Stephen Fabre in French. I grew up in France, and I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO uh, of LifeBlocks. Um, and for those who don't know, LifeBlocks is a company that helps uh, developers and, and companies make their applications and products uh, collaborative, just just like Google Docs, Figma, uh, Notion, those kind of products. So uh, we try to provide the APIs and all the tools to to make that very easy uh, for you all. Just realized I forgot my color effects. Like nice. can't Bit, can't right do that the without the backlighting. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, so so this is something that I I think is it, it's a trend I've noticed is that you know originally it felt like only Google Docs did this, where you had this this idea of like multiple people were in one document, you could see their cursors, and you were kind of following them around, and that was incredible. And then it, it, but it just didn't seem like anybody else had the money, the technology to do it. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, Figma introduced it. And then we started seeing it in like a lot of SaaS apps. And now it sort of feels like it's becoming like, I kind of feel like it's almost becoming table stakes for a SaaS app. Like if you want to build something competitive, yep. you, you need that presence API, you need to have collaborative editing. Um, but how, like, it just sounds so hard, <laughs> right? Like this idea of needing to know not only like, okay, so user auth in and of itself is already this big challenge. And then there's the, the auth challenge of like, okay, so now we have multiple people in and we need to be able to, to determine whether or not they're logged into the same instance or the same like, you know, organization yeah. or something. Um, so you have to show just, just putting their avatars in. All right. There's already a challenge there that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. But then there's this idea, okay, so now we've got documents though. And in a document, one of the major challenges is that like documents are not just like these monolithic things. They're, they're tons and tons of little pieces. And for someone to be editing this one and me to be editing this one and this to not somehow become a completely unmergeable mess, it just like my whole brain starts to hurt when I think about doing this. And so if somebody told me that I needed to build this, I think I would just say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so from your standpoint, this is this is clearly something that you saw as uh, as a trend, or as I imagine you wouldn't have started a company around it. But so, what? One, why did you decide to take this bet? And then I have a follow up question. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. So, um. Honestly, I had no idea we'd start a company around this. Uh, <laughs> we kind of uh, kind of stumbled upon this with my co-founder, uh, Guillaume, who's based in Montreal. And um, we, uh, both of us, we uh, we used to work at Envision. And mm -hmm. personally, I worked in creative tools for, you know, uh, probably 10 to 15 years at this point. And, um, and while we were at Envision, uh, we were working on a product called Envision Studio. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Envision Studio was this uh, design tool that worked uh, on the desktop, was a desktop-based application where you could do you know, UI design, but you could also do like prototyping and animation. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, kind of Figma uh, came along, and uh, Figma was browser-based, multiplayer, was like super performant. And so they were starting to take a lot of like market share, and a lot of the design industry was looking at Figma and starting to use Figma. And so we had this project there to uh, essentially convert Envision Studio from a desktop-based, file-based application, right? Mm. You, you actually save files to save them locally. And we had a project to convert that to a browser-based uh, applications where everything would just you know, work in the, browser, uh, in the browser and then you have multiple people kind of uh, uh, editing the same file. 
Right. So, and so yeah, you you so, did yeah. get that project that I would have I would have just said no to. They were like, yeah, go do that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, but full disclaimer, I was not an engineer uh, on that team. I was uh, heading up design for that cloud project. Okay. And, uh, and uh, yeah, turns out we were like a team of like, I think at the peak we were like six, seven people just mm. on this cloud project. And uh, it took about a year and a half to literally go from not like desktop-based application to like something that, that worked in the browser. Uh, and, and it was still... Uh, still, still a very. Like the experience was not as performant as it needed to be. There was like a little bit of delay between you know the live cursors and the actual data of the document. Uh -huh. um, so it worked, but it wasn't like a perfect uh, experience that you would expect in a, in a tool like Figma or you know Google Docs, some of those other tools. Sure. And so that's basically you know, where I first got exposed to this problem. Uh, again, I still had no idea we started a company around this at that time. I was just a little bit frustrated that it took so long. Yeah. And to me, it felt like, look, like Google, you know, Google uh, with Google Docs, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they um, they were able to like cr take a lot of market shares from like uh, Microsoft Office because it worked like, right. you know, it was collaborative, it was multiplayer. You didn't have to install an app to get it to work. Uh, so distribution is a lot better. The user experience is a lot better. And they were able to pull that off like 10, 15 years ago. And then Figma, they basically proved you could actually do this like mm -hmm. for like a, a high quality design tool uh, used by professionals. And um, I don't know, to me it felt at that point like pretty much every SaaS product was going to go in that direction. Um, so yeah, it was frustrating that it it would it was so hard to do. Uh, so at the time, I understand like a lot of people would say no uh, to to this idea, like you would. Um, but yeah, I ended up leaving Envision eventually, um, and then with my uh, co-founder Guillaume, we actually started working on a video slash presentation tool, and we wanted to make it multiplayer and collaborative. Mm. And eventually, basically months into that project basically felt like what we had just experienced at Envision. We're like, damn. Once again, we're spending all of our time trying to figure out the real-time collaboration aspect right. of things, and we are not focused on actual like the actual tools themselves. Right. And that's when it clicked. That's when it clicked. We're like, okay, let's let's actually start a company around this. All the APIs and, and infrastructure that we built for this tool, let's try to productify it and make it so that every like any developer could use it for their own uh, product. So that's that's right. how we sort of stumbled uh, on this. Like it wasn't like a, a master plan. We're gonna be doing this. Uh, it kind sure. of sort of happened organically. So I have uh, I have more questions about the like I I want to get into actually building with this, but to to sort of contextualize this for somebody who hasn't attempted to build one of these and is is maybe looking at this like it's a a great big mystery box of like I I don't even know where I would start. Um, why is this so hard? Like, what is happening under the hood that that makes this challenge so daunting for for companies? And and like, why has it been such a blocker for companies that it takes a year and a half to build? Uh, there, there's a ton of like complexity involved in it. I think to me, every piece that makes a collaborative product. On their own are pretty difficult, you know, the, the infrastructure piece, like making it all work with like WebSocket, scaling a WebSocket servers. If some of you listening have, have worked with that, you know that they're pretty hard to scale. Uh, handling reconnections, like automatic connections of like WebSocket is pretty difficult. You know, if your computer is going to sleep, like you need to like build like a ping pong mechanism to, to reconnect. There's a lot of like stuff to figure out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... Another thing that's really difficult also is to enable, as you mentioned earlier, multiple people to edit the same data at the same time and resolve those conflicts in real time and make sure that everybody always sees the same state of an app. Right. Uh, being able to work offline as well is one of the things. Um, and then I would say that what makes this even harder is to get all of those things to work very nicely together. So presence the infrastructure I just talked about around WebSocket, making sure that that scales and works nicely, enabling multiple people to edit the document at the same time. Comments, like if you want to mm -hmm. add comments, like how do you make sure the comment experience works nicely with the live document you're looking at? Mm -hmm. So there's all those pieces making them tie together to create a cohesive experience. I think that's what makes it very hard. 
Um, so, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it's one of those things where um, you know the what makes complexity so challenging is that individually any one of these things is relatively straightforward, right? To set up a WebSocket connection is you know it's a web standard. You just say like, give me a new WebSocket, upgrade my connection. But then yeah. you are st you start building state off of that, and then if your connection gets lost, you have to like maintain the state and make sure that you reestablish mm -hmm. the connection and then don't like, you know, reset back to zero or lose all somebody's progress because of a blip in the connection. And as you said, offline support and like, okay, if I go offline and I get on an airplane, I'm going to go for two hours of just like writing on this document. Yeah. And then when I come back online, that has to merge in with all the changes that got made while I was working yeah. offline. The, the, each one of these things is like sort of mechanically simple. When you start thinking about the, the, you know, the 15, 20 different simple concepts that all have to sit to fit together seamlessly now, it becomes incredibly complex and, and incredibly challenging to, to work on, um, which is, you know, which is why I think if a company told me to do that, I was like, you know, it sounds like Envision was willing to put the resources on it. They're like, hey, we'll give you, you know, a yeah. team. That team is only going to work on this. But I feel like a lot of times what happens is companies don't quite grasp the the sneaky complexity of something that they're asking for. And they go, well, a couple engineers can probably do that in a few weeks, right? It's like, oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a lot harder than you seem sometimes until you, you put your, your head to it. It's just. Yeah, never ending. Uh, but so, hopefully, hopefully we make that a little bit easier now. Yeah. So. Okay. So, so let's talk specifically about LiveBlock. So, so LiveBlocks is a company that is dedicated to sort of taming this complexity and making something that you can drop into one of your your existing SaaS product. Um, mm -hmm. So, as, like, I, it might be easier to just show. So, tell me if it's easier to switch over and start coding. But, w like, as a developer, when I reach for LiveBlocks. How am I fitting this in? Because a lot of this stuff feels like it might be very idiosyncratic. Like the the app needs the things that it needs, and it doesn't need the things that it doesn't need. So how do you how do you make something as complex as like what LiveBlocks is offering generic enough to fit into any SaaS application? That's a good question. Uh, I think it depends. I mean. All of our customers have different use cases, so mm -hmm. it really depends on like what you're trying to build. Mm -hmm. And when you build, if you have an existing product, it's not like your product is collaborative on nothing. It's like it's a, you know, there's an incremental steps to get to like a Figma-like or Google Docs-like experience. Like you don't need to have all the things to make your app collaborative. So, you know, some people. Uh, depending on their use case, uh, you know, if they have an existing product and they just want to make their product a little bit more real time, mm -hmm. maybe you can still rely on your own database and just use like some like WebSocket broadcast events to make it a little bit more dynamic and like automatically kind of refresh the page. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, that's enough. Um, some customers want to add like we're working on a new product around uh, comments at the moment. And you know, some people just want to add the comment panel, uh, mm -hmm. and that's fine. So, we try to uh, sort of package our products based on very specific part of the collaborative experience and the use cases as well that you're trying to build. Got so it. That's how we think about it, but it's not always easy. We try to abstract it in a way that you know, depending on, depending on what you want to use, you can sort of choose and pick what you need. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So I think any other questions that I have, it's definitely going to be easier to, to show rather than tell. So why don't I switch us over into uh, the pair programming view? Let's do it. And I'm going to do that by moving this over here and this over here and then clicking this button. Okay. So uh, this episode, like every episode, is being live captioned. We've got Diane here with us today. Thank you very much, Diane. And that is made possible through the support of our sponsors. We've got Netlify and Vetsu Code kicking in to make this show more accessible to more people. And I do have room for more sponsors if your company is feeling such a thing. Um, we are talking to uh, Stephen. And if you are on Twitter, because it's always Twitter, uh, you can go and... 
Thanks. Give a follow there. <laughs> never, never. Uh, uh. So, <laughs> we're talking about Live Blocks today. So this is the uh, this is the Live Blocks homepage, um, and from here, if I want to get started, what uh, where should I go first? What should be my first step as a a Live Blocks noob? Uh, I think it's um, it really depends, but there's there's multiple ways. I think what we could do. Uh, perhaps since we have quite a bit of time, I think it's probably, yeah, let's go through the docs perhaps. And okay. we have a, an interactive tutorial that takes you step by step through the concept. So I think that's probably the best way to uh, get started and learn uh, learn live blocks. Okay. Uh, and then at the end, if we have time, I think uh, I would love to show you kind of the starter kit, uh, which basically combines all of the products and concepts that we have within live blocks, all the APIs and everything mm -hmm. into one cohesive Next.js kind of a starter kit that includes pretty much all the things you can do to create a Figma-like application. But to Great. get started, I would say let's go into the tutorial here, and uh, that's probably what's going to be the most uh, the most relevant to you all. OK. So I'm in the tutorial. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, Chris from our team built this. Uh, we shipped this maybe about a month or a month and a half ago. And the idea is to kind of take you through the concepts of Flyblocks in a very uh, interactive way. And so. On the left here, you basically basically explain to you like what LiveBlocks is, uh, and this is essentially a dynamic sort of uh, interactive tutorial that you know you can use the code uh, snippet at the top. You don't even need to open VS Code uh, just to run the concepts. Uh, so here, uh, all right, you're ready. I guess you. I'm ready. True. <laughs> oh, this is cool. Okay. <laughs> and all right. then, I think you need to hit return perhaps to for it to. Let's yeah, it updated to to let's start, which is great. Okay, okay, nice. Uh, and if not, there's like I'm stuck. Show solution in the bottom left corner. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so this is similar to like the um, like the, I think the Svelte docs do this, the Solid docs do this. Uh, this sort of you you get to have the the first experience by getting a problem and solving it, and then you've always got that bailout button. Or if you've done it before and you just want to see what the code snippet looks like, you can say, "Yeah, just give me the give me the code." Um, exactly. We nice. we took a lot of inspiration from like the Svelte uh, interactive tutorial. I think mm -hmm. um, there's a few others that I think Astro has one as well. Maybe some others. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's really hard when you build like a, a Dev Tools uh, product, like because like there's different kinds of developers. Like some of them. Mm -hmm. I uh, want to go straight to the API reference and that's all they need. But there's some people want to learn through like a simple tutorial. Some people want to learn through examples. We try to give different options based on like what you prefer. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, essentially uh, for LiveBlocks, uh, all everything starts with like, obviously you need to connect to LiveBlocks. So um, here we have this config file. So every time you create a project, there's this LiveBlocks uh, config file that you need to create. We have a comment to to generate that so npx so create live blocks app uh, mm -hmm. which you have on the left here and that generates this uh, ts file automatically for you oh, nice. uh, put in your you know api key uh, which is there's a demo api key here um, and then we uh, create like a factory if you look if you scroll down here on the right uh, that will give you basically all the hooks you need within react uh, to build collaborative experiences. So there are hooks here like to do like present stuff. You want to do like live cursors. There are hooks here to do uh, to store uh, uh, the document data. So like multiple people can edit that. And this is basically where you do that setup. Okay. So I think here to to continue. Uh, so here you have, you know, use undo, use redo, uh, use mutation. It's a little bit blur on my screen, uh, by the way. So it's hard for me to read all the, yeah, all me... the text, uh, Jason. But... Let me make it a little bit bigger here so that uh, hopefully that's easier to okay. see. Nice. So here, if you come in a uh, room provider, I think it should uh, take you to the next step. Cool. So you're connected. Nice, nice. Oh, now we've got, look, we've got live cursors. Exactly. So now there's a bit of magic happening. We'll get into how to actually build this in a little uh, in a little bit. But here, uh, if you go to the next page, if you go on the, these arrows at the top as well, if you want to navigate. Oh, arrows here. Got cool. It. So now that's, yeah, I mean, they, they both work. Uh, so here, uh, the idea is to, if you look on the left, is to basically uh, uh, change the code so that uh, in the app TSX file, you uh, actually connect to a room. And the way we enable this uh, within a React application with LiveBlocks is we have this, this room provider. And then 
you just pass a room ID. And in most cases, a room ID, if you were to build like a Figma-like product, the room ID would be the ID of the document. Uh, if you were to build like a Google Docs, that would be the ID of the, the document. So typically that maps to, uh, to a document. And the room is essentially the concept we use for essentially the digital space in which you collaborate together. Got it. All right, let's... Uh... Nice. Okay, and then I have a room. Yeah, it's already imported at the top, so just pass the room. Uh, and, a random uh, a room ID should be a string. Yeah. Did you tell me to use a specific room ID? No, that's fine. You can use one. That's okay. fine. Um, and then uh, yeah, if you want, we um, uh, if you could scroll up a little bit on the left side, um. This is kind of up to you, but if you want to show like a loading screen, you can use uh, Suspense. And we have like a client-side Suspense, uh, which essentially is very similar to you know, the one they use in React. So that as the, the room is loading, you can have like a loading state, uh, which is pretty standard for, for like um, most collaborative apps. Um, yeah, and then... Cool. Okay, yeah. so I'll grab this and move it. You don't always have to do this one, but I think it's a nice, nice, uh, nice one to do. Props uh, children is not a function. Oh, right, turned. right. This needs to be a function. Oh yeah, this. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, I think so, we're, do we're doing pretty well so far. I was expecting a uh, nice. Like, it's pretty hard to do some uh, live coding, so glad it works. All right, we're, we're uh, sweet, humming so along. Yes. All right. Concept. So I think the one thing that's uh, really key to understand with, with live blocks is so I talked about the room concept. So mm -hmm. you know the collaboration happened within happened within the room, and so within that, there's different things you can do. So we have the concept of presence, mm -hmm. uh, and so presence you can use that for live cursors, or you can use that to show a live avatar stack of the people that are currently in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a concept of broadcast, you know, where you can broadcast events events to all the people that are currently in the room. So if you right, want to say, okay. hey, I'm Jason over here, I've clicked this thing and you broadcast that to everybody else, people can see that on the other end. And then we have storage. And storage is essentially a persisted data store within the room. So um, so if you wanted to display others, or let's do, I think there's a live cursor using presence page here. We can probably jump to that. It's okay. going to be cool for people to see. Uh, all right, so here uh, there is, you see, uh, we're essentially updating the cursor. So if you scroll down in the code, uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? We do on pointer move. That's a standard React event listener. Mm -hmm. And then we handle the pointer move. And if you look at the function for pointer move, you know, we just take right. the event, client X, client Y. Those are just the coordinates of the cursor. And we say update my presence, and we pass that in, uh, and um, and that's essentially how you you build live cursors. So now, if you wanted to display the cursors, uh, you would need to uh, here we're just displaying the value, mm -hmm. um, but we want to actually display a cursor component. So, Got it. Exactly. So here we have a hook which is called use others. There you go, and All that right. essentially lists all the people that are currently live in the room and their presence. And okay. so then if you scroll down, all you have to do within uh, the div here is pass uh, like a cursor. I think we already have a, a cursor imported at the top components. So you just, you know, the cursor, pass the X and Y. And so this and would be... This would be... Do I need others. to like... Oh, you actually... Do you I loop do over map, this? I think. Yeah, I think so, so like... Yeah. Uh, let's see. We'll go others dot map, and then uh, for the cursor. Each one of those will have a cursor, so it'd be presence, it's gonna right? Be, I think it's gonna be. I forgot it's present. I think it's gonna. Be, that's right. Yeah, I think that's presence. Right. Return, and then we want to return uh, yes, a cursor, and the cursor has an be. X, which looks like it would be presence dot cursor x. dot y, x and it y be that, yeah. would be the same presence cursor y 
Yes. Something went wrong. Let's uh, let's crawl down on the left. Perhaps it's gonna. I think we may be on the left hand side. It should give you the. Uh... Oh yes. Okay. Oh, we use the connection oh, ID because we need to pass the key. Got yeah. it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So so first we have to filter. Oh, you have to filter because like yeah, the the presence cursor value could be null. Got it. So other presence cursor does not equal null. Yes. Okay. And then so we'll we'll do a little little cleanup on this code yeah. here. And then we get our map. Hmm. What do I oh, have? you need to pass the connection ID as well as a key. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I need the connection similar. ID. And then we'll set a key. I think I'm missing a... a yeah, a, a parenthesis or something. Yeah. I can't, can't really see. Let's see. Okay, so... Oh, this looks good, though. One. <laughs> there yes. it is. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's try to move your cursor now. Let's see if that. Oh, there you go. So, as you can see on the right hand side, you're moving and that's displaying a cursor component, which, mm -hmm. if you click on the cursor, that's essentially uh, just an SVG. So, if you look at the file, that's probably just an SVG that, that looks like a cursor. Mm -hmm. So, this is just to show you like the kind of stuff you can do with this. Obviously, with presence, you can attach. You know, uh, user information. We have uh, a way to do like a proper authentication endpoint, so you can assign the name, the avatar, and build all kinds of cool stuff with this. Yeah. Uh, all right, and perhaps uh, maybe before we get into the the starter kit, what could be cool is uh, maybe show some like storage concepts. I think. Sure. Because I think that's probably the. Yeah. So storage. Uh, so we have uh, what we call live block storage. And as I said earlier, this is essentially our persisted uh, data store where you would store documents and enable multiple people to edit that data uh, simultaneously. And so within, within storage, uh, we have three different data types. Live object, very similar to like a JavaScript object, uh, a live map, and a live list. But we make okay. sure that when people edit items within storage, we resolve the conflicts and make sure everybody sees the same stuff. So a good example of that, uh, you know, if you were to build an ordered list of items, mm -hmm. uh, let's say you do that locally, like imagine you just do like a standard array. Right. Like, that's pretty easy because you know the index, right? If you reorder it. Right. But what if you have five people reordering things? How do you know the index? So you need to sort of resolve that stuff. Um, and so that's basically the kind of stuff live blocks um, uh, handles for you. Gotcha. Okay. That's that's and good so, because I uh, think that's what, like those types of challenges are what lead to like, I know I've been in some apps where if somebody's in a document, it'll show you that they're there. And so you get the presence, but then the document locks when somebody else is editing right? And then that person has to remember when they're done to leave the document or else nobody else can edit it, right? And so the, the, those challenges are, are really, really hard to resolve. So this is, this is exciting if, if this is one of those like just works kind of moments. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, so let's see, the first yeah, thing I need to do. It's like, yeah, so yeah. Um, so as I said, same thing, like we have this, this config file. So here, um, yeah, let's create a person. Just a live object of the name and the age. Okay, so I've got my got my live object set yeah. up here. And what's um, one thing that's nice also with this config file is that um, we try to do everything for to optimize for TypeScript. So like once you define your types here, everywhere in your app, like as you type within VS Code, it will kind of tell you like. The types properly so you don't have to redefine them in multiple spots right it's pretty pretty neat for uh, the developer experience that is um, always wonderful yeah, so, so uh, i'm adding my initial storage which is a person and that's going to be a mm -hmm. new live object and that live object if i can avoid the typos uh whoops <laughs> might not be able to avoid the typos okay we got a name Yes. And an age. Mary? 
There you go. Okay, so um, we've added an object, right? Um, but we're not using it yet. This is the way to set yet. the initial, initial document, more or less, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah, to display that storage, uh, if you go, uh, I think, yeah, you have to go back here. Uh, we have, like, hooks to, like, get the storage. And, um, yeah, in that case, we just want to get the person directly. Okay. And so uh, the way that this works, from what I can understand, is, uh, let's see, I need to actually import this. So we're going to import yes. use storage from uh, dot config. live blocks config. Okay, mm -hmm. so then we've got, so we're calling this, this use seems... storage, and that gives yep. us the root. The root yep. is whatever gets put into here. Exactly. Okay. Correct. So then when yep. I go to root.person, it is whatever the value is in dot .person. Exactly. That okay. is your persisted state. It's shared between everybody that's, that has access to that room, and that persists over time. It's basically, a, it's pretty much a database at this point. Um, got it. A persisted it, database. It's persisted yeah. where? Like it's persisted in live blocks? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the storage is essentially every room. So every room is essentially a mini server that lives on the on the edge. And okay. so each room is close to whoever connects to that room first. It's going to pick like a closed edge location, meaning that you'll be able to have like really fast performance. Uh, so in that case, Jason, if you were to start the room, uh, I think you're in... On the west coast, uh, right. it will probably be pick an edge location close to you. If I started, I'm I'm in Paris right now. I will be an edge location in Paris. So um, that's essentially what happens. And then so storage, uh, it is we have a, a, a database sort of attached uh, to that room that persists over time, and this is where you store your documents data. Got it. And enable multiple people to edit it. Now, so how so this is persistent in the sense that for as long as someone uses that room ID, this data is yep. is stable. Um, it's not like if, if everybody disconnects and then we come back to it in a year, the data will still be here? It will still be there. Uh, and as a developer, you have APIs to, if you want to clear the data, um, you, you have APIs to do this. If you want to clear it, uh, you know, sync it to your own DB, you can do that. Uh, or if you just want to use that as your own uh, DB, you can do that as well. So it's kind of up to you. Uh, but by Got default, it. everything uh, persists. Okay. Yep. Um, and we, we've got a question from the chat on conflict resolution, which it sounds like we're, we're just starting to edge up against this where we have, like, we've got storage now, right? So how does this work when I start making changes to this? Yeah, so it depends on the uh, data type that you use. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, we have, uh, you know, live object, which is the, the one we're using here for person. Uh, we have live maps and live lists. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a live object, every key of that object, you can have you, JSON, that man manipulates like the name, like the name Mary. I could be editing age at the same time, and we'll make sure that this works. Uh, so uh, this is we, we built like our own sort of uh, uh, logic, and uh, some of the conflicts get resolved in the backend, but some of them kind of depends on like the order of actions. Um, so there's it's. Inspired by CRDT, but it's not like a pure decentralized CRDT. I don't know if people are, are familiar with this. Uh, um, but that's uh, yeah, and a, a CRDT is a um, conflict we'll just, free. We'll just, I never remember <laughs> conflict free replicated data, data type. types, which is um, you know I I I'm not like a an engineer by trade, so this is way above uh, you know uh, the kind of stuff I can do. But there's a ton of like. Paperwork that's been done on this. There's a ton of really cool open source projects, like YGS is one of them. Mm. Uh, that were kind of like the that's kind of the the the, the big one right now that's been adopted uh, by Kevin Jans. And so um, that's typically what what a CRDT is. Um, it basically gives you different data types uh, so that multiple people can manipulate that data together and kind mm -hmm. of resolve uh, the conflict. Um, so that's essentially. We take a very similar approach, and um, given all background, Guillaume and Guillaume and myself, like working at Envision and being super focused on on creative tools, we actually took a lot of inspiration from what uh, 
Figma was doing. So we spent mm -hmm. quite a bit of time like trying to reverse engineer how they did things, like what happens when like multiple people like reorder items within the list, which tends to happen fairly often in a design tool. You know, you have a list of layers and you can like sort of move them around. Right. Uh, so like that's the kind of stuff uh, we've been thinking about. So for live list, I think this is a quite a maybe I'm getting too deep into the weeds here and, and let me know. But uh, I think what's uh, happy to share some uh, blog posts from Figma, but uh, Evan Wallace, I think, wrote um, a great blog post about like how they reorder lists at Figma and they use um, they use uh, something called fractional indexing, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. Essentially, uh, instead of using like a standard index within the lists, yeah, this is it, I think. Yeah, so this tells you a little bit more about it. Uh, it gets pretty deep, but essentially, when you reorder some things to enable multiple people to reorder that list, um, you essentially, when you add an item between an index and another one, you basically make the division between the two and you give like a fractional index okay. uh, so that this always remains in the right order. So if you have like a something at an index 0. Point, if you want to add something between index 0. 0.2 and 0. 0.3, it's going to create a 0. 0.25 uh, index and it's always going to be in the same order no matter what people do uh, for everybody that, that kind of changes uh, the order of things within that list. Got it. So that's that's kind of the technique we use for for this. Very cool. Okay. For live list at least. Yeah. Nice. So uh, okay. So we uh, I've I've moved to the modifying storage part. Do you want to? Uh, let's see. We we have. I mean, we've got another like forty five minutes or so that we can we can code. So do you want to keep going through this, or did you want to get into the uh, the template? Well, you know what? Let's get. Uh, I think we probably good enough. Uh, kind of uh, concepts. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, let's, let's get into, uh, the template so that we can get into VS code and actually, uh, okay. do more real coding. And now the, the template is, uh, let's uh, see. If you Google, I think if you Google like Versal live blocks, you should be able to find it. Whoops. That's not it at all. Let me, I have it in my other window here. It's this, this oh, one here, go. right? Yeah, and um, maybe we can give a glimpse uh, at what this looks like. So there's a view demo uh, in this thumbnail itself. There's a oh, here it is. Bit hidden. Yeah. So we've got this. Oh, you're already logged in. Uh, but if you log out, uh, we have this uh, starter kit, uh, Next.js uh, template starter kit. Uh, that includes... Essentially, your marketing page where you are, you're, you are logged out of your application. Mm -hmm. It includes authentication so that you click sign in and you can authenticate through. Uh, we use Next Auth uh, and that can integrate with like the kind of standard provider like O0 or whatever, or Clerk even. Um, and then, uh, if you sign in, uh, just to show people the kind of stuff you can do with this. Uh, so here we just picked like a fake sign in uh, for now, but like you can just sign in as somebody here, and here you have a workspace, mm -hmm. right? Which you have in like every pretty much SaaS collaborative product. There's a workspace in which you have a list of documents. So this is what this is. Uh, you have your draft. You have groups, uh, and uh, here you can create a new draft, for instance. Uh, whiteboard is the only one that's uh, available now. And this is your whiteboard, right? It's a pretty basic whiteboard. Uh, we didn't want to add too many features. It's just a, it's just meant to help you get started. But we handle all the routing and stuff. So like the you know the ID of the room is in the URL. This is what we used to do, uh, kind of the room provider. Uh, there's a concept of presence. So if you if you open this like side by side, uh, Jason, like people will see that um, you know this is all multiplayer and yeah. Let me grab the link here, and then I will. Do a split window. Yeah. Arc, is, Arc is pretty sweet for that. Nice. So yeah, there you go. So this is uh, basically you're, you're logged in into this and you see you basically can add like different notes and you have the live cursors and, and that sort yeah. of stuff. And I think so, if I throw this, I believe if I throw this in here, anybody who wants to. Now, oh, here's yeah. the thing, chat. Yeah, if you all come in here and start doing inappropriate stuff, <laughs> we're going to be fighting. Um <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this is like this is cool stuff though because it it makes it possible to pretty quickly get in and and start building this. So 
this is uh is this like whiteboard part the drag and drop is that built into live blocks or is this a um is this kind of like a, a demo app built on top of live blocks this is more like a demo app built on gotcha. top of live blocks okay uh so right now we as i showed in the kind of the sorry the interactive tutorial that we just went through mm -hmm. uh, we only provide the kind of the the hooks and the APIs to enable you to build pretty much any experiences. Right. Um, but uh, we don't, we're starting to invest more into like actually providing actual React components that include some of those uh, pre built features. But yeah, um, so what, what I was thinking of doing today is kind of show you how that works and how we can start building some of those kind of collaborative experiences. Yeah, very cool. Okay. All right. I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. So uh, if you go to, liveblocks.io slash starter kit. I think you have it open maybe somewhere or maybe not. This one? Uh, no, this is the Versal version. So I think uh, I just want to get the NPX command because I don't remember remember it by heart. Yeah, starter kit. I think there's a dash maybe. I forgot. Maybe not. Yeah, there you go. So you want to copy this and uh, there you go. You can just uh, yeah paste it. Okay, so I'm going to run one. this uh, here. Yeah, and this is going and to now it's take you through the steps. All right, and so we'll call this LWJ Live Blocks. Um, uh, I recommend picking demo for now because you don't want to have it's going to be a lot harder to do. Okay, it looks like it's got stuff. deployment built in, so we'll just hit yes. Do I want to install? Yes. Open browser window to continue setup. Sure. So there you go. You are in Vercel now. Oh, you're not logged in, so you need to uh, probably log in with uh, Vercel. Oh, there you go. Okay. So we're going to do this. And then yep. I can't do... That's right. Vercel won't let you do organization, so I'll use my personal account because they, they want that money for those organizations. Yeah. <laughs> there um, you go. So... Now it's asking you to add the Lightblocks integration. Okay. And uh, this should open a little Lightblocks window. There you go. So nice. you can create the account from Lightblocks. And we're going. We're back. So you can pick, you can create a new project or. Those are those two kind of default projects. We'll with, but yeah, we'll go with the dev project. That seems like the right call. Um, yeah, then you can just click uh, import API key. Nice. And that just sent it to Vercel, I assume? Yeah, this Slick. is going to deploy now automatically. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you wait, it takes probably 30 seconds usually within Vercel. Okay. Uh, and while but we on the right, you can that, see that now. I'm going to open yeah, a new be, repo. And what's nice is that this is automatically linked to your GitHub as well now. Nice. So whatever you set up in Vercel, that's linked. Oh, nice. So this is like cool. Yeah, it hooked it all up. That's really nice. Yeah. So this is just a way like to quickly sort of get started. You know, if you use Next, um, and if you want to kind of play around with live blocks and see the kind of stuff you you want to build, it's it's great. Or if you build like a completely new product from scratch, you get all kind of the the entire foundation you need, like the workspace view, the the marketing side view logged out. Also, like when you don't have access to a document, like there's permissions involved in this. Like you know, if you like there's mm -hmm. few permissions, write mm -hmm. permissions, everything in there is is included. So like share dialogues, nice. all that stuff. Um, so. Still building, it looks like on the left. It, yep. But I think we should get some. Uh, oh, there you go. Look at the animation now from Vercel. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, nice. um, so this is deployed now. You have you actually have your URL, I think. Like if you go here, and this yeah, this is live. Okay. Like, so well, I, I think that, we've yeah. we've got it. Um, there you go. Question about your database. What what's the default database for Live Blocks? You mentioned it was like an edge storage. Yeah. So behind the scenes, we rely on uh, Cloudflare Workers. Mm. Yeah, it's 
such an awesome infrastructure and essentially uh, everything we do at LiveBlocks, not everything, but a good chunk of it relies on that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so uh, each uh, each storage uh, data store that I mentioned, uh, this is stored on, um, I forgot the name, uh, Cloudflare Workers Durable Objects. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Right. Durable. Yeah. Uh, durable so objects. Each, yeah, yeah. 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 And so edge, each, um, each room lives on an edge location and each edge location has a durable object in which we store, um, uh, life block storage. Uh, and that's the kind of the persisted, uh, got it system that we use for, for storing data. Cool. Very cool. All right. So, um, let's see. So this is the, this is the demo we just looked at. So this is all going to look the same as it did before. Um, be exactly but, the same. So let's dig into what the code does. Yeah. Um, let's, let's look into it and you'll probably, instead of loading the kind of hosted version, you probably want to, uh, run NPM run dev so that we can work, uh, locally. I don't know if you need to install. I think it does the install. To my it, yeah. It did yeah, the install as part of the code. CLI. Nice. And it set up the uh, big, uh, big shout out to Chris and the team who, uh, who built this, uh, this awesome kind of end-to-end -end experience with the CLI. Uh, yeah, this is slick. Time to get it right. Okay, so it's oh, it's already running. I'm, I'm just, I was waiting for it to do something. Uh, okay, so we got localhost three thousand. There you go. And here is our app. All right, so this is the local Boom. version of the app. There you go. Uh, little disclaimer, we don't use the app folder yet, uh, on this, this is, uh, this is on the old, uh, kind of setup, but, um, I mean, it seems uh, like you have your pages. I don't know. I, <laughs> it seems like the app folder is a little early to make like the default, right? <laughs> it seems like they're still uh, kind of launching things like, yeah, this almost works now. <laughs> yeah, I know there's, uh, there's a lot of like back and forth on that side. We're, mm -hmm. we're actually starting to, to move a lot of for kind of examples to, to the app folder. Um, okay. th there's a lot of benefits to that. Uh, but the kind of the, the starter kit is still on this kind of uh, old way. Got it. So got it. I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with uh, Next.js. So we have, we got the pages here, which is where, this, where they do the, the routing. And so uh, what I think could be cool perhaps is to dive into um, the whiteboard experience. Yeah, let's do so, it. So so here, you know, you pass the ID. So this is essentially all you get the, all you get the kind of room ID when you create a new a new whiteboard mm -hmm. and um, we should be loading a whiteboard component in this, I believe. Uh, let's see. So we got the whiteboard document view, scroll down server side props. It's uh, probably in here. Is it the whiteboard component? Yeah, this is it. Yep. Okay. And so one thing that could be cool, let's, uh, let's think about what we could build here. Uh, so, Perhaps I thought something that could be interesting is uh, we could make it so that you know those notes that we have on the on the whiteboard. Perhaps we could have like a some kind of resolved checkbox. Oh yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, if that yeah. makes complete sense, but I think this is kind of show the concept uh, to people perhaps. So, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. so here we okay, go. So we've got our notes. All right, so let me yeah, see if I so, can let's see let's let's do a quick intuition test because we walked through how storage works and we walked through uh, how to access that and so let's see if I can figure out how to make this work. So I'm going to I'm going to look for where we're setting up our room provider. And my guess is let's see my my instinct is to start looking out here. There's a session provider um, we've got our index, not there. It's a room provider coming in. Room provider. Okay. So we got our room provider and our room provider should be getting initial storage. So I want to find right. where that is set. Initial storage is yeah. a new live map. Okay. So each it's, note um is a live map. And that means that uh, if it works like a JavaScript map object, we can just set any key we want. Um, yes. Okay, that's fine. So then... And if you want to see the state of your... Like everything... If you want to see the state from a type, like TypeScript point of view, like how the types are set up, mm -hmm. uh, usually just look for like liveblocks.config and this is where you will be able to see everything you need. Um, so that's kind of why we kind of did that setup. So you scroll down a little bit. 
this is a bit more complicated than usual, but like here, Note. there it is. Okay. So you got your, you see your storage is like a live map of notes and then uh, a or note you said resolve. Uh, Let's go. Of, yeah. Okay. So we can set up a, a resolved like mm -hmm. toggle. Um, and then we get. Uh, oh, and I need to. Sh uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. And then. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much all you need to do here in terms of like setting up the data structure for it. Uh, but now we need to uh, include it here, right where we set up the node here. So you want to make sure that you set a nice default. Okay, so, so by good. default, it is um, not resolved. Yes. Okay. And down where we render the notes. Handle note change. Let's see if we can just get it to display first. So here's our whiteboard note. And that yep. is defined you go in that? where? That is yeah. here. Let's so let's get this open. Different um yeah. and we get our note. So yeah. And then we should be able to set something like a we've got a div. Uh where's yeah. our so we probably so header. here I believe the the button that's the cl close button with the like the, the X icon mm -hmm. um so yeah i think we we actually have a checkbox component so you might want to maybe that might be make it a bit easier this one you. yeah i think we use it somewhere else so that makes it pretty easy for you to add here okay uh yeah checked and then we would be able to say uh n is it just note resolved hey auto complete our way to victory go. Do I need anything else, or can I just drop this? Let's say uh, I believe you need. I haven't checked initial value. Is, I think you need an initial value, and you want to make sure you have a, a handler for the on value change to actually change the storage data for that. Okay, so this is the part that I actually have to define. But so if we leave this off mm -hmm. to start, then what we should be able to see is at least a reporting yep. of what's happening. Yes, so this, when I go in work. here yep. and choose a profile. And uh, we'll open up a new whiteboard, mm -hmm. add a note, and we have a checkbox. And maybe uh, you want to try to see if it works if you <laughs> open it uh, with like multiple windows. Oh yeah, let's do that. That should that should that should be live. Okay, That's so then old, to yeah. can I split? I can split. Uh, we're gonna add a right split, and we'll go to localhost three thousand again. Get into it. Oh, and, it, and we, there's oh. something we haven't done actually yet. I haven't showed you yet. Um, maybe I'm going into different directions here, but if you were to uh, open like a incognito window, I don't know how that works with Arc. Oh, you I could. could um, uh, yeah, you could I can try to open this URL, and then you actually don't have access to it. So there's like a there's like all those kind of flows that are kind of handled as well. Mm -hmm. Let me get this one open. But, um, Drop this in. You see? Not allowed access. Exactly. But you could sign in as like somebody else, like this person, for instance. And then on the top, like share, if you could do share dialogue. Share. Uh, and you could add this other person. So you want to, uh, if you get the email, I think it was, oh, it's not going to show up automatically here. Oh, you gotcha. Grab it from... We need. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. And then if you add this person here. They have read access right now. So if you open the other one or whatever. Okay, so we'll go back in here. Now I can see and it. See? So, and the the real thing here is that the workspace updated automatically. You didn't have to refresh here. I didn't have so to refresh. So as soon as you oh, give nice. access, as soon as you add people, all that stuff is handled automatically. Okay. Um, and so let now me... you click it, you click this, and you'll be able to see it as another person. So this yeah, is just something me... that we. Can I get this to? I don't know why this one won't show up for me. Oh, there you, we go. This is what I wanted. It was both at the same time. Okay. So oh, now if I go okay. in here and I make Anjali edit, I get edit access immediately. Uh, this I, I don't think this is showing on your on your screen, uh, Jason. It's not. Uh, I'm not seeing. I mean, I'm just seeing the code editor, and on the left, I'm seeing uh, the two arc windows. Wait, what's going on here? Maybe it, it like my desktop froze in that window. Are we 
So I'm seeing the code editor on the right and the two arc windows on the left. Yeah, it just uh me um let me see if I can Ooh. Are you back? You're back. Okay. All right. So now, now we're, we're, I don't know why that just happened, but it froze on me. But, uh, okay. So this is (laughs) all good. (laughs) Now we've got the, it's, it's working. We have what we want. Uh, we've got the shared cursor and it did update live. So, uh, in this I'm, Mm. I'm Mislav in this one and I am Anjali in this one. So if I turn off edit access, it updates right away. Oh, my favorite. Yeah, a read only, uh, and you can't add anything at that point. But you can still see the cursor. If you add a note, you will be able to see it. And if you click resolve, you should still see it as well. Well, not yet because we didn't. Um, we haven't. Oh, we haven't synced right. that part yet. You haven't yet. built. You're right. You haven't synced that up yet. Yeah. Okay. Right. So now to make this sync up, um, we have right, the so... the checked status. We have the initial value. Mm-hmm. Um, we yep. need to then add an on value change. And we need to make a function for this. So the function that right. I want to create is we'll just uh, we'll do handle no. resolved, I guess, or we'll say toggle, and mm-hmm. then we need to do something. But for now, we can we can stub it and it's, then uh, yeah. drop this in here. Correct. Handle resolve toggle. Okay. So yes. right now it doesn't do anything, but we need to make it update our note storage right. so to help you here so we have a use mutation hook to mutate data on the storage but i think what will be easier for you perhaps uh is to go to the whiteboard component and look how we do like a delete for instance and that will give you a hint of like kind of how you need to set that up handle uh, from the checkbox change handle let's see probably change is probably okay right uh, oh wait, no, that goes to handle note update. I think the delete will probably be easier if you look at the delete one handle. Handle note delete. Let's get to that. Okay. Yeah, there you so, go. We're using mutation. Mutation mm-hmm. gets storage, and then is this my my own user? And then I get this the ID of the user, one. And um, because we have a permission system that I, we haven't gone through this yet, uh, you can actually, in that case, you know, if the user is has like read only permissions you don't mm-hmm. want you don't want that user to be able to edit uh so this is kind of a check you could potentially be doing as well cuz I mean, we can try we can try without the without the without the check and and with the check and see what happens for the read only got it okay so i can take this one and i can mm-hmm. drop this in here and instead of deleting our note um let's see yeah. first and foremost i need to make sure that we're actually importing this and then we want to. You want to actually get the ID of the note because, like, right now you're getting all the notes, so you want to get the. Actually, just the ID. I believe you have the ID uh, imported directly into the note as a prop. Um. So go up. Yeah. So you D. probably want to grab this ID. Yep. Okay. And I think. Yeah, and then if you go back up a little bit, uh, in the use mutation at the top, here, uh, this one, I don't think it's not ID. This is, what you're gonna be getting here is um, is a, is checked or checked, I guess. That's basically the value so the, you're gonna get from uh, from the call from the, uh, the the component. And oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and so now you should have your. Note. So what we want to do is actually set a specific property of that live object to whatever value we need. So set resolved, checked. And what? Oh, hmm. oh it's a prettier problem. Okay. I can Whoa, do that. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, that was <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think this should work. Um, okay, so yeah. theoretically speaking, <laughs> oh, look at go. that. I mean, nice. it, this is great. This like works. <laughs> it, uh, it, wor- it, it does what I expect, right? Like use use mutation is straightforward. We get kind of a context object with live blocks yep. data, and then we get 
a piece of data from the, um, this is the only piece that feels a little bit magic to me. So how, how does the, the on value change? It, it just sends back. I believe on value change sends the checked value. On value yeah, change. Boolean. Handle change. Okay. So it's, you're just, you wrote an abstraction over yeah. how it works. I get it. Yeah. Uh, I got it was it. just in the app. We had this this component, but essentially you could just build like a standard kind of input. Um, got it. That's that's the value you get in the mutation there. So very very cool that this just works, right? Like it's um, this is a, a it's a nice like it's a nice API. It feels familiar. I've I've seen this approach to handling data mutation in in a bunch of apps. It doesn't feel like. Like at no point here when I'm looking at this, am I thinking about, well, how do I sync this with all of these other people who are looking at this right now? I'm just thinking about how do I get data to update in my app? Well, I get the note by its ID and then I set the value to the new value and everything else just sort of happens. That's right. That's that, but basically the, the idea where the kind of the approach we're taking is to, we want this to feel very familiar mm -hmm. to Essentially, if you were to build an, an app locally with React, right. we want it to feel very similar to that so that you don't need to really you know, think about like, oh my gosh, like config resolution or like what's going to happen on the server. Mm -hmm. We try to take away that complexity and make it super familiar to any kind of React front-end developer so that they can build those kind of multiplayer experiences very easily. That's kind of a, the idea of, uh, of storage and kind of the APIs we have for React. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, this is, this is really nice. Like this feels good. And, you know, for anybody who's, who wasn't, uh, wasn't paying attention when we set this up initially, we've got, I'm an incognito on this one. And so I'm in, I'm two users. Uh, I am Mislav in this one and I am, yeah. uh, Anjali in this one. And this one is read only, so I can't do anything. Right. But when I come over here, I can edit, I can move. Um, make changes, like all of that is happening and it's being reflected in real time. And the the code to make that happen is basically a big stack of these mutations. <laughs> <laughs> a big stack of the mutation. There's a lot of code here for sure. Uh, but yeah, it, it's pretty straightforward. Like you do mutations to kind of update the storage and then you have access to kind of list maps objects that are all live um, mm -hmm. and uh, we handle all that stuff for you um, Jason one thing that could be cool actually we, we haven't done this I don't know if we have a lot of time but maybe one thing that could be interesting to look at is multiplayer undo redo uh, yeah yeah why not that is uh, so if you look at the window on the top you get two uh, little buttons here on the at the bottom to kind of undo and redo. Uh, and so basically, the undo redo are like local to that uh, user. And so maybe we can look at the code for this uh, because I think it's it's one thing that is pretty hard to do, and we try to make it a lot easier for people. Uh, so if you go. Maybe look, go to the whiteboard component. I'm not sure exactly where the toolbar is. It's going to be a toolbar somewhere. Tooltip undo, tooltip redo. Yeah, so here's our toolbar. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So we have a we have a history, a use history hook. Uh, so if you click that, you should be able to take you to that hook. Uh, there you go. Use history hook. Or if, and then uh, based on that, you can literally just call history undo. Mm -hmm. Or history redo, and that will that will basically enable that uh, and so, automatically within your app. So anytime we send any mutation, um, the, it's going into a stack. Now is mm -hmm. that? And you said that that's currently limited to. Let me give edit access here again. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, window one. Yeah, and then we say no two, and then up here I'm going to. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and that, that's 
that's pretty hard to do otherwise. And so we're trying to make that very easy. Um, and uh, yeah, you can map that. You know, here we mapped it to, you know, buttons. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could, you know, map it to a keyboard shortcut and that sort of stuff and just call that that thing. One thing that's uh, maybe interesting to touch on uh, related to this is like if you, there are cases where you actually don't want to include mutations in well, I, the undo reduce stack. Like I just thought of one because I noticed that as I was, as like I was undoing and redoing, um, I noticed that the presence, like the presence change was, was one of those things. And like, I don't really care about undoing whether or not, you know, this, this user was part of the presence stack. I kind of want to skip that one and go to the next like key press. Yeah. Correct. So you can actually ignore that stuff if you okay. want. Uh, we have, um, especially another, another use case maybe that I can demo to you here. Like if you were to drag the, like a note, like when you mouse down, between when you mouse down and when you mouse up, if you undo, you don't want to have like, you don't want to have to do like 20 undo to go back to the initial state. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is one of those things as well, like where we, I don't know exactly what that is, but, but there's, a proper, there's probably like um, a function here that's called set, uh, where we set kind of the X, Y coordinates of the node uh, handle pointer down history pause yeah so we're there we're kind go. of like stopping the history mm -hmm. to not end up with a million yep. uh events okay exactly so that's that's essentially a way to do it uh and then for presence we actually have um uh a setting when you set the presence to say including history yes or no and uh, depending on that you can include it or not so it's kind of up to you uh, to decide. So I think the that presence be... happens when you select a, an, a whiteboard note. I think there's probably like a... Whiteboard note, and speed. then we've got... Let's look. Let's Drag. see, use mutation. If you scroll down a bit, I think it would be... On focus, I think it's on focus that's being called. So it's probably. Okay, so uh, we can go. Yeah, so it's probably going to be, that event's going to be in um, in whiteboard, I think. Because it's just uh, imported from whiteboard. So oh, yeah, there it. you go. And if you click on focus, I believe we're doing something there to set the and presence. Handle note focus. Right. So, so we... handle note update, note ID, selected by. You see? This is, mm -hmm. if you go to, we, we, we don't only, if you go to the config file, you will see that presence in this example is just not, it's not just, um, uh, it's not, oh yeah, it's probably not just the cursor. It's also like what you have selected. Uh, maybe we haven't updated it here. Uh, but what you could do is if you go back to, the whiteboard, uh, handle not update. Oh, because it's stored on the, okay. It's stored on the actual note itself. So selected by, um, but there's something for presence to kind of decide, like, I don't want to include it in any story and you could decide not to kind of have it in the undo stack. So which Got is pretty, it. pretty handy. Yeah, so so theoretically we could we could even just like turn these particular ones off and mm -hmm. it should uh, why don't we try it? Let's try it. Oh, because I also this gives us the ability to like lock these, right? Because if it's selected by me, then somebody else can't select you it. Um You could do that. Yep. But we that's not what it's doing right now, right? Uh I let's what does the handle not update do? If you click on that. Handle note update. I don't know what that is. Handle note update. Uh, no, no. Get note, note update. Okay. Note ID. So it looks like it's just kind of throwing whatever we want in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, I think, I mean, there's different ways to build the selection. Like typically, the way I like to do it, and it's, I don't think this is how it's handled here, is to actually store. Within presence, you could store the ID of a note and then actually use that information to show selection instead mm -hmm. of doing something like this. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
there's different ways like you can architect the app based on like what you want to do but um yeah so you just yeah. kind of have to look at, at what you actually want to deal with um so mm -hmm. if i go back down here and we just say we don't really care who's who's looking at the app right now and we save this then when i come in here yeah. and we look yeah, we can kinda, nothing happens yeah nothing happens um, mm -hmm. and then we make some changes here, change there, come back up here, do some und updates, undos, right? Mm -hmm. So all, uh, yep. all kind of leads to where we want to be, where we've got the ability to do undo, redo all that good stuff. Um, so this is, yeah, this is great. Like I, I can see, you know, it, it what I like about this is it, it sort of, takes this very big complicated knot of thinking about not just storage, not just application state, but also the distribution and, and syncing of that state. And it reduces it down to these, these more granular controls. When someone yeah. clicks a thing, what do you want to happen? And then it syncs across all the different people looking at the app. Um, and we, we end up with this sort of it's a it's complex because a lot is happening, but it's not complex because you have to juggle a lot of things. It's it's a complex stack of very simple of simple interactions, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's about the best you can hope for when you're getting into something multiplayer. Is that you know you you're not thinking about how does this fit into the broader context of like all the ways these these apps plug together, but rather how how does the complex state of this app function in this app like if i was going to write this with right. just react state you know i'm, I'm going to put together a, a con like my own custom context i don't know that it would be a lot different in terms of what i build than than what's being built right here and i think that's good like from a mental model standpoint it's it's not adding yet another thing you've got to juggle like if you can build a react app you can build a multiplayer react app and i think that's the the sort of um, the big win here with these sorts of abstractions is it, it lets you use your skills as, as they are today. You don't have to add like yet another layer of expertise. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much the angle we're trying to take. So I'm glad to, to hear that from you. Like, uh, we're, we're trying to make it super familiar to, mm -hmm. you know, if you used to react ecosystem, like you would le like the way you would build your react app as a single player would be almost identical like it would be pretty easy actually to write it single player and then kind of switch it multiplayer afterwards um yeah especially you know given the, that the states with stuff like you know use mutation use query these are all becoming pretty mm -hmm. common apis and um so i i can see this feeling pretty familiar i think you know where it gets tricky is is when you've got the the subtle differences like you know a storage api isn't going to be in the context api right so you you have different ways of, of accessing things, but the, the general mental model is, is good. Like it, it lets me work in a way that I already understand. Um, and this is, this looks to me the same as if I was using something that wasn't multiplayer. Like if I was using a, a MongoDB, like their use mutation hook would probably feel pretty same. You've got, you've got your, your database object that you're going to do like a database get notes. And then you, yeah. you select down to the ID and then you make a change. Um, but then, you would need another piece if you wanted to do the presence, whereas this one is, it's all just kind of rolled up yep. in the thing. And and so, yeah, I like this. I think this is uh, this is really nice to work with. Does this have, like, so you're, you said you're using durable objects. Do you have, like, other integrations? Like, if developers want to start customizing this stuff, which pieces are, like, you got to use live blocks exactly as is versus, like, you can kind of do whatever you want? Yeah, so right now you sort of have to use live blocks as is. So we provide those different hooks and those different ways to integrate. Mm -hmm. uh, to integrate, sorry. And um, but yeah, we are working on like different ways to enable uh, people to to do more custom stuff. Uh, but this is not quite that hasn't quite landed yet. Uh, but I'm very excited to like enable people to kind of leverage your infrastructure to do a lot of custom stuff as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now you kind of. Uh, kind of have to use exactly kind of the APIs and that sort of stuff. So we have uh, one package for React, which is uh, the one we've used here. Uh, but we also have packages for uh, state management libraries like Zustand and Redux. Uh, that makes it pretty easy. And then we have a standard one for JavaScript, which is pretty cool. Uh, so even if you use Vue or like Svelte or something like that, you can just integrate directly with um, 
with the client API. Got it. Essentially, a React API that we use today is just an abstraction on top of that. Got it. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. So there's there's uh, these packages, and then there's also just a straight up REST API. Correct. So this is something we also provide, like with the platform, is that everything that you use today, mm -hmm. we actually, actually comes with like a lot of stuff you can do on the dashboard itself. So we have like you know REST APIs if you want to fetch like a specific room or like users within a room or like the storage data of that room. You can do that, and uh, also stuff like webhooks, which mm -hmm. is pretty handy. Like we we have a good amount of customers using webhooks to sync data to their own system or do that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, maybe I should we should have done this at the beginning. It's probably a bit late, but we also have a a DevTools browser extension, uh, which I think is pretty handy. Like you know, I remember in the early days of React when the DevTools extension came out. It just made building React applications so much easier. Mm. Uh, we're trying to do something similar here. So we have, um, if you ever want to build a multiplayer application, we have this kind of desk tools that you can install, uh, which is pretty pretty handy. It kind of shows you all the storage, kind of data presence, makes it very easy to like build, like see see your state in real time because you have multiple people can that can manipulate that state. It's pretty helpful to to get a, a view of that. Yeah, this is slick. So, so we get um, a view into the storage, a view into the presence. You mm -hmm. get your history. So, what we were just looking at with uh, like the presence events, we could actually see these in history and and kind of take a look and see like, oh, well, we don't need that one, so we can we can skip that kind of stuff. Um, Correct. And that's all off of okay. So this is like a re-implementing Excel kind of thing. Um, yep. Cool. Very, very cool. Like that's a that's super handy. So for anybody who's going to be playing with that, go check out those dev tools. Um, there's a question from Jacob in the chat. Uh, what kind of custom use cases are you expecting or looking to support in the near term? Which I guess is a... Is what that, kind of custom? What, <laughs> what's the roadmap? <laughs> <laughs> what is the roadmap? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is... Um, in terms of use cases, so right now, everything that we looked at today mm -hmm. is around tools and APIs to build multiplayer editors. Right. So a space in which you're kind of together, collaborating on, a, on an artifact, a document, or something like that. And then you can do that through like presence, broadcast, and storage. We are working on comments, which is like a, a different kind of like use case that's not this directly related to the... Um, to the multiplayer editor itself. But this mm -hmm. is another kind of collaboration use case that to us is pretty important, like being able to like mention somebody uh, in a document so that they can like get notified and come to that document. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of a pretty big part of collaboration. This is something we're enabling now. So uh, we're adding more people like to, to the beta at the moment. So if you're interested, feel free to sign up for that. And cool, in terms cool. of like enabling uh, custom codes, we want to um, enable people to uh, kind of deploy their own sort of uh, code into this infrastructure as well. So it will be pretty pretty flexible in terms of what you want to do. So if you want to add custom logic or, or permissions, uh, this is something we want to enable as well. Nice. So this is the, the comments beta if you want to get in on that. Um, awesome. Well, so if, if folks want to go deeper, like we've got the, the website, we've got, um, we've got this list of products, we've got the docs, there's dev tools. Where else should folks go? Like, what what else do you think people should uh, should check out if they want to get started with Live Blocks? Yeah, I mean, check out the the website. The docs is good. Uh, we're quite we try to be quite active on Discord, and uh, there's a pretty big community kind of uh, helping each other out as they build multiplayer applications. There, uh, there should be a link somewhere in the footer here, uh, and then I guess Twitter probably. Twitter is uh, at Live Blocks. Um, if you want to follow us and um, yeah please let us know if you have questions uh, thoughts feedback feature ideas uh, would love to hear it so Discord awesome. Twitter is spot for that great all right well uh, I think that is about all our time for today so I will take this as a, a great opportunity to wrap it up if you want to hear more you know go go check out live blocks and all the links that we just shared or follow Steven 
Um, and this episode, like every episode, has been live captioned. We've had Diane with us here all day. Thank you so much, Diane. That's from White Coat Captioning, and that's made possible through our sponsors, Netlify and Vetsu Code, both kicking in to make this show more accessible to more people. Um, while you're checking out things on the site, make sure you go and look at the schedule. We've got stuff getting added all the time. Very, very excited about this one. We've got uh, Una Kravitz coming on. We're just going to do a roundup of like all the new APIs that are dropping as standard parts of the platform. So HTML and CSS new APIs and, and functionality. Uh, that's going to be an absolute blast. Uh, we are also looking at, um, we're going to talk about Couchbase. I got to get that one up on the website. Excited about that. We are going to have Miriam Suzanne, and I think we're going to do a deep dive into container queries. Like all sorts of good stuff is coming up on the show. And if there's something that you want to see, you can always get on the newsletter, send me a message or get on the discord and, uh, and you know, do that as well. With that, we're going to call this one done. Steven, any parting words before we wrap this up? No, I mean, I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to participate in this show. That was really fun. So I hope people enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I hope people will try it out. All right, y'all. We'll go find somebody to raid and we will see you all next time. <laughs>